This is the Monday, May 9th, 2016 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new interview every Monday morning, as well as Classical Wisdom Wednesdays and History in Five Fridays. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Today, our time machine opens its doors into the wardrobe of our first ladies, that Narnia of fashion that trends back to the very first days of our republic, when the role of the president's wife, as the role of the president himself, had yet to be defined. And just as the presidency has evolved, so has the role of the first lady. Our guest on this topic is Feather Schwartz Foster, a presidential historian who focuses on our first ladies from Martha Washington to Mamie Eisenhower. She's here to share her new book, Mary Lincoln's Flannel Pajamas, and other stories from the first lady's closet. Feather teaches adult classes with programs associated with the College of William and Mary and Christopher Newport University. Look her up at featherfoster.com or follow her at Feather S. Foster on Twitter. Okay, now that we've peeked into the closet, let's meet Feather Foster and check out Mary Lincoln's Flannel Pajamas. I'm joined on the line by the extremely energetic, really exciting person to talk to, Feather Foster. She's author of Mary Lincoln's Flannel Pajamas and Other Stories from the First Lady's Closet. Thank you so much for making time to talk with the History Author Show. I'm happy to do it. Now, you were just telling me before we started that you like to talk to dead people. So, Oh, I do. <laughs> and that's exciting for you. And you write history, you said, for people that think history doesn't matter, that kind of thing. So talk a little bit about that, about how the people you're aiming at with Mary Lincoln's flannel pajamas maybe think they never want to pick up a history book. Well, when I talk to a lot of people, and I do, I, I do a lot of signings and lectures and talks, and I get these very no-sounding yeses when I ask them about, do you like history? And go, well, I don't know, and what well, I suppose. And I really have come to believe that the people who don't like history don't like it because they were never properly introduced. They never learned it from the ground up by the time they were five and six years old so that they grow to really have a good understanding of it. And today we can introduce people to a bunch of women who you and I feel like many of them are our friends. It they are. <laughs> they are my dear companions and have been for years. Yes. Yes, and it's nice to see them pop up. And for myself, I've read a lot of presidential bios. I've read some of their wives. I interviewed Betty Boyd Caroli about a lady who's a first lady a little beyond yours. That is Lady Bird Johnson. That's a lot of ladies there at once. But mm -hmm. I interviewed her about her book, Lady Bird and Lyndon. And you get to know her in a new way, but she's pretty modern for my taste and your taste. Yeah. Our, our time frame sort of cuts off there with Mamie Eisenhower. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. And yet, despite all that reading, I found myself learning a lot more about these women than I'd come across before. And when I pick up a book, sometimes I'm a little bit worried that this is going to be all stuff I've read before, that it's all going to be just copied off Wikipedia or something. And I, I wouldn't want to have somebody out for that. And I wouldn't want to read it because I've kind of done it already as somebody who's mm -hmm. steeped in this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. for, but I found new things. And for example, where else to start but Martha Washington. As such a wealthy woman, I never thought of her as somebody who sewed or somebody who cooked or anything. 
but you have a very homey anecdote about her and her speckled apron. So and tell her us. Speckled apron. Martha Martha Washington was a very wealthy woman, but she wasn't born wealthy. She was born gentry, like Washington was. They came from a good family. The family had property. They had a certain amount of money certainly enough to get them a seat in the House of Burgesses, but they were not what you would call the real wealthy, the Burrs and the Carters and the Lees, you know, of Virginia. And she married Daniel Park Custis, her first husband, and he was very, very, very wealthy. And so most of the Washington wealth came from her being the widow of a, a very, very wealthy man. So she learned how to cook and sew and do all those domestic things from when she was a girl. And her sewing was basically limited to the fancy work, the embroidery, and she did it very, very well. And she supervised in the kitchen, and she was up every morning at 5 a.m. or even earlier (laughs) to go down to the kitchens and help supervise and make sure this got done and that got done. She was very, very hands-on. When she became the wife of the General George Washington. By that time, she was already into her 40s. And she wore elegant clothes. But at the beginning of the Revolutionary War, and as a matter of fact, even a little bit before that, the Washingtons had signed a pledge that they were not going to import any English trade goods. And that included silks and satins and velvets and all the fancy materials. So Martha was wearing more of the homemade fabrics that she could fashion into her clothes. And because they didn't have dry cleaning, of course, aprons were an essential. Every, all women wore aprons because they couldn't clean their clothes too easily, certainly not their really nice stuff. And when she was up in Morristown or uh, visiting George Washington uh, in his encampment up there, all the you know, fine ladies of the Morristown area came to call on her, and they were very surprised to see her welcome them. And she, here she is wearing a speckled apron. And the speckling comes from a coarse material, like an unbleached muslin that has this speckled type of look almost bound into the grain of it. It was a coarse apron. It was a work apron. It was the kind of fabric that servants' clothes might be made out of. And Martha's wearing this apron, and, you know, they felt a little put out that she wasn't there greeting them in all her finery. But she was there with her sewing basket, and she sort of welcomed them. She was nice. They liked her. But she let it be known that when they came to visit, bring your work baskets. We're here to work, ladies. (laughs) We are here to sew and knit and do for the cause. So that was her work apron. Mm -hmm. And you can see the Washington Headquarters Museum, by the way, in Morristown, New Jersey. I wanted to give them a shout out because it's one that I definitely enjoy. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing about her pin cushion, correct? And that's sort of one of those gray areas of history like Washington chopping down the cherry tree. But that's another little piece there about Martha Washington that I hadn't heard before. You pack so many of these little anecdotes here into Mary Lincoln's flannel pajamas, and you don't even do all of the first ladies. So now it's even no. more amazing. What sparked your interest first in looking at the woman behind the man in American history? I've been collecting presidential books for <clears throat> years, a lot of years, and I have a very extensive personal library of about 1,500 books on just the individual presidents. We put a room on the house when we moved down here wow. to house the library. And then I've got a bunch of uh, maybe another 300 ancillary books on the presidency or the White House or election years or you know related subjects. And then I have another hundred and a half books on wow. what I consider social history of the United States. So I've got a lot of stuff here. And my interest was always in presidential history. And, of course, the first ladies are part of it. But when I started writing about the first ladies, which was back in the mid-90s, started out as an avocation. Now it's sort of my retirement 
whatever I do. And when I started doing the first ladies, I did them because they were a lot more fun to write about. When you write about a president, you must take it seriously. You must deal with it on a serious basis. These were leaders of a great country. You know, you might tell a little joke about them. You might tell an anecdote here and there, but they must be treated very, very seriously. And the problem is I'm not that serious a writer. <laughs> I'm a light writer. Yeah, I can tell. I, you you're know, a fun, you're yeah. fun person. You want to have, you know, I hey, Grover, do. come on. Get, take off that yeah. uh, jacket. It's hard to be. <laughs> yeah, it is very, very hard to deal with Grover Cleveland lightly. You yeah. Know, the <laughs> but with the first ladies, you can. You can. And there is a wealth of stuff out there. All you have to do is find the story of it. You know, sometimes these little anecdotes turn up in a this or a that, and they're like tossed off in three lines because that's all that actually shows up, but it hasn't been fleshed out. How did this occur? The reason behind it, the reason behind Martha's speckled apron and the statement that it was making. They're wonderful stories. And there are so many things that remind us of them, whether it's the portrait gallery or whether it's the first spouse's coins that they have now. Or mm -hmm. I think we can relate to the first ladies much more than we can to a president. I didn't think of it until you were just saying that. When I read about a first lady, I say, boy, she has to watch it much more. She's, she's in the wake of somebody else. She has to be looked at as a person with authority, and yet she's really not in office, and she maybe didn't even want to sign up for this yeah. job. A more modern example would have been Laura Welsh Bush, George W. Bush's wife, and she said, he mm -hmm. promised me I would never have to give a political speech. He said, just give one when he ran for Congress, and that would be it. Well, of course, mm -hmm. you know, then your career takes off, and you end up giving speeches at the two Republican national conventions and a million in between. So that's something that I think we can all relate to in a first lady being pulled along on something, even if it's something on a very small scale where you have to reflect well. I think we can all have so much fun with that when we read a book like yours that does take it as a bit of an amusement, that they're kind of winking at us, especially like a Julia Grant who's a lot of fun. And in the last line of Mary Lincoln's Flannel Pajamas, you state that clearly as your goal. You write, quote, my purpose has always been to make history as enjoyable to the reader as it has been to me, unquote. Yeah. And yeah. these are not footnotes anymore to you. These are real people. They are real people. And they're lovely people. And you have to remember that only three of them married presidents. Huh. The rest of them just married guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they really did. They they got married at normal marriageable ages, say in their early 20s or so, average ages, and they weren't marrying somebody that they said, oh, this is going to be the president of the United States. That would have been the last thing that yeah. they would be thinking about. And so they just married guys. And my whole original thought when I started writing about the first lady is, what kind of a woman would this particular man marry? What would attract them? What brings them together? You know, what is behind all of this? Because you really need to know that. It says something about him, too, in yes, looking at them through the spouse. And I think we all have that in a relationship. Mm -hmm. you, know, you learn something about who you're attracted to, and you learn pretty quickly if you made a wrong connection with somebody who maybe like the Tafts. He didn't have that ambition to be president. But Mrs. Taft definitely looked at him and said, this guy's going places, and I'm going to be yeah. first lady one day. That's it. That's a tough thing to have. Or, you know, the Pierces, Franklin Pierce, that's a very tragic story that they have as they're going to Washington. And their son gets killed in very horrible fashion on the train. He's almost completely mm -hmm. decapitated in front of them. She goes into the White House as a broken woman. And those are things I think in history you turn away from. You feel bad for the wife of the president and the president maybe, and then you just move on. But you managed to introduce them to us here in Mary Lincoln's flannel pajamas to everyday things that aren't just 
the footnote that they suffered this terrible tragedy or she went to this college, those of them that did, the later ones, Mm -hmm. how they struggled really to pay for the clothes they wanted a lot of times. And one of those examples is Louisa Adams, John Quincy Adams' wife. So why don't you talk about how she tried to stretch her wardrobe? Because this is a great story. I had not read it before. Louisa Adams and John Quincy Adams were really a very interesting couple. He had a stellar career from the get-go. By the time he was in college, he was probably the most cosmopolitan young man of his generation, having been educated in Europe since he was about 10 years old. But the Adamses were not wealthy. The family never got to be wealthy until uh, the third generation of them, Charles Francis Adams, and he married it. So the Adamses were very middle-class people, and when John Quincy Adams was sent to St. Petersburg, Russia, in the 18-teens, or says somewhere 1810, He was there during the war, wasn't he, 1812? Yeah, during the Napoleonic Wars. He was in St. Petersburg, Russia, and it was a big, big, mega court society. And court societies always have all their little etiquettes and their protocols. And your dress has to be this length of the train and you have to have these kind of jewels. And they were very, very precise about what was expected. And John Quincy Adams's counterparts, his European counterparts, who were also ambassadors, were usually all counts and barons and dukes and royalty who had very, very deep pockets. And John Quincy Adams did not have deep pockets. His salary wasn't all that much. And it was also very far from home. You know, this is 1810, 1812. And Russia and the United States are a long distance apart. And the mails didn't come through very quickly. So he didn't get his checks very regularly. (laughs) They had to manage the best they could. And Louisa only had a limited number of what you might call court acceptable gowns, <laughs> you know, that they had to wear. We're not talking about let's go to the grocery store, let's take a walk in the park. We're talking about go to one of these very, very formal functions. And so what women did, she did it, and women were doing it for generations after that, is they remake their clothes or they have it done, she would go to a dressmaker and have her best gown redone. They take the sleeves off and they change the sleeves. They change the neckline. They would add trim. They would take trim away and they would put in an insert of a different color. They would make the gowns look different. And so she would only have this one basic gown And she would pay somebody a small amount to fix it, to redesign it, to reconfigure it so that maybe it would look a little bit different. It's sort of like today where you would have a gal have a nice basic pair of black slacks or a black skirt and she'd dress it up or dress it down by wearing a different blouse or jacket or sweater or Mm -hmm. something or use different jewelry or scarves to just make it look different and make it accessible. They did not have the money for her to go out and have another gown made. Well, it's going to probably be the first time anyone ever made this connection, John Quincy Adams and Homer Simpson. But (laughs) I think of an episode of The Simpsons where Marge finds, uh, I guess it's a Chanel dress, buried in the discount rack and she buys it. Mm -hmm. And one of her friends sees her pumping gas and they suddenly want her to be with the popular girls. And she keeps going to the sewing machine and redoing it and redoing it and trying to make it look a little bit new. So she looks like she continuously has a new thing to wear. And that's... That's kind of what I pictured. And for Louisa Adams, because she's our only foreign-born first lady, we know she's English, we associate Mm -hmm. her with being, I do anyway, just speaking for myself, a little bit more cultured, that she would always have the right clothes. She was very highly cultured. Yes, she was. No, you're not not mistaken about that. No, she was definitely well-educated, well-cultured. Yeah, she just married somebody who couldn't 
but put the keep up with the Dukes. So that's something Theodore Roosevelt yeah. said when he went on a tour of London and Europe after he was president. And he said, "If I see another king, I will bite him." And that's sort of that was Theodore. Yeah, yeah. Theodore Roosevelt <laughs> said, "Yeah," and I said, "That's what it sort of made me think of because you didn't have ambassadors as you do today that." Every country sends to every other. We were not a major power. Only the major powers would have had a real ambassador and have a real position there. So, That's right. And JQA, of course, is also thinking about back home. You know, this is a republic that my father helped found. I don't want to look like I'm putting on airs and they already were always accusing the Adams of being royalists. So that had to be a concern and that did haunt him later in his career. They made up some yes, yeah, real crazy lies about him too on yeah. that score. So – there you go. The wife has to worry about it. And there are many of those moments in your book. I love doing it. My guest is author Feather Schwartz Foster, and her book is Mary Lincoln's Flannel Pajamas and Other Stories from the First Lady's Closet. You can enjoy a sample chapter of the book absolutely free. You don't have to give your email address or a credit card or anything. Just visit featherfoster.com. And if you join me in following at Feather S. Foster on Twitter, you'll see many more fun stories about our first couples. Feather is very active on Twitter, which is nice to see. Farron W. Smith, founder of the Edith Bowling Wilson Birthplace Foundation and Museum, wrote, quote, I found the stories from the First Lady's Closet fascinating and entertaining. Fashions pertaining to first ladies are intriguing. These fun-loving stories of the world of fashion of first ladies are insightful and are sure to make you smile, unquote. And that's very nice, especially since it comes from one of these keepers of historic figures, presidential sites, and I've been to many of them myself. They are protective of the people that live there. They really are their friends. They're living with their images all the time. They're living with their stories. They're often seeing the descendants come in there. They're very active for them. So I wanted to ask you from that perspective, mm -hmm. how did you approach folks like those at the Edith Bowling Wilson Birthplace Foundation? How did you go to them and say, I want to tell this intimate portrait? And what has their reaction been now that the book is out? Um, Farron and I go back a ways. We go back about five years or so that I have been in touch with her because the Edith Bowling Wilson birthplace is in Virginia. Okay. I have not been there. I will get there. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, Farron and I have talked about my going out and doing a program or a signing or something. The thing is, you're from New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey. That's why we get along so well. It must be, you know, but... <laughs> Virginia and New Jersey are about neck and neck population wise, but size wise, Virginia is 10 times bigger. Yeah. That's literally, it is about 10 times as large as New Jersey. So between here and Withville, it's a long haul. This is not like, you know, take a run down the shore or something. Yeah. It's not. It, this is a big one. So I have not gotten there, but I've spoken and emailed back and forth with Farron several times over the years, and she's always been very, very good about answering my questions or forwarding me on or trying to be as helpful as possible. I've also been in touch with a lot of other presidential sites, and I've gone to so many of them over the years. And this is what I have found. The ones that are privately run and operated, like Edith's Birthplace, the ones that are privately operated are usually the most happy to see you, glad to cooperate. They are so grateful that you've showed up and that you're <laughs> interested. Oh, isn't this wonderful? I love it. But the large ones, like a Mount Vernon or a Monticello and places that are of mega stuff there, they're very nice, but they are correct. You know what I'm saying? Like people expected Martha Washington to be. When she showed up with that apron, yeah. right, they were saying, wait, I expected something different. Only you're on the reverse yeah. side of that. <laughs> yeah. Those big sites, they got a lot of rules. And rules and I have never been friends. <laughs> I don't care for them a lot. I understand that people need to have them. And I do respect the fact that they need to have them. And I will respect your rules, of course. But it doesn't make me like them any better because I feel that they sort of impede progress a lot. 
Yeah, and you're a fun-loving person. The whole point of your book is to break figuratively the loose side case here and take out Mary Lincoln's flannel pajamas or take out the Ida McKinley blue booties and mm-hmm. handle them. That's hard for you to go from yeah. sort of having to wear yeah. the white gloves to meet the people. You want those stories, I would think. You do want the stories. And I also found, and this is part of the rules, and I do understand and I do respect them. Don't misunderstand that. I would have loved to have been able to get some of the photographs or, you know, that I could use, but they were rather expensive. They were expensive to get the permissions and the scans. A few sites did send me some things they said that I could have for free that were public domain. Personally, I thought that a lot of places should have them all public domain by now. These ladies have been dead for centuries. Yeah, you'd think so. You would think so, but they were so expensive, and you can't just buy one. I would have to have a lot of them. It just would not make good business sense to spend that kind of money, you know, maybe anywhere between 75 and and $100 a piece. That runs into some serious money here. Yeah, and especially when you feel this is history and it should belong to all of us. So there's sort of – I would have that resistance right. anyway. Even if I was willing to put it into it, I would say unless it's going directly to a charitable foundation. But when you're talking about the ones that are run by the Park Service, mm-hmm. I mean all of NASA's photos and video are all public domain because we pay for them. So if we're paying to yeah. upkeep a presidential site, I would think that that would fall under it. But maybe the photographers own it. I I can't say I know, but it just leaves a bad taste a little bit. Oh, you know, I did understand. And, and, you know, my publisher and I, we had a little chat about it. And I said, this is just not going to work. You know, it was too expensive. And nobody is going to buy my book for those pictures. Yeah. Well, I can find a Sarah Polk if I want to. Yes, you can. And I was going to say, it makes sense that Virginia is 10 times the size of New Jersey because they have 10 times as many presidential birthplaces. We just have Grover Cleveland. Virginia used to be even bigger. Yeah. Well, and we have the Church of Presidents, though, and we have a lovely author that wrote a book about the ladies of the New Jersey Shore that you were kind enough to introduce me to. And a lot of those Mm -hmm. first ladies did let their hair down at the New Jersey Shore. That was a big spot in the Gilded Age, wasn't it? Oh, it was. Long Branch, New Jersey was one of the posh playgrounds of the rich and the famous. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Tease that book for us because I haven't read it yet, but you told me about it. Karen Schnitzpan is a maven about the New Jersey Shore. And some years ago, maybe 10, 12 years ago or so, I was working on a book uh, called Garfield's Train, which was a novel about President Garfield dying at the New Jersey Shore in Long Branch. And I wasn't planning on making a novel out of it because I really don't want to write novels. But I found that it was so difficult to find the kind of information I wanted to do what I wanted. I said, all right, fine, I'll write a novel. This way I can play. You know, I can play with it a little bit. Although most of the information there was factual. I just invented some fictional characters to move the plot along, Mm -hmm. you know. But anyway, I did contact Karen because she had written a book, A Feel for the Town. It had to do with some of the great hotels of Long Branch, you know, the great watering places. And and so I did email her, and I think I may have spoken to her on the phone going back several years. And we kept in touch. And then when she was writing her book about the remarkable women, and she was trying to talk about Julia Grant and Creep Garfield, two of whom spent quite a bit of time down at the shore. She had contacted me, and so we emailed back and forth. We helped each other out. Nice gal. Nice gal. You'll like meeting her. (laughs) And by the way, folks, you can get to where Garfield died today. The cottage is no longer there where he passed away. That burned down, but there is a marker, and it's in Elberon, New Jersey today, so no longer called Long Ranch. And whenever I take that North Jersey coastline down from the city and the train stops in Elberon, I always think of when they laid the tracks for his funeral train Mm -hmm. to bring them bring him to the cottage, hoping he would get better. He didn't. And to show you that Feather Schwartz Foster really knows her stuff here in Mary Lincoln's flannel pajamas, outside of the James A. Garfield home in Mentor, Ohio, which I've also been to, 
I don't think there's anybody else who calls Lucretia Garfield Crete except myself, the author we're speaking to today, Feather Foster, and Johnny Cash, who's no longer with us, who sings a great old Western ballad that people should go listen to right now on YouTube, which is called Mr. Garfield. Johnny Cash sings it, and there is a refrain in there where he calls her Crete, and he says he called her Crete, and she called him James. Mm -hmm. And so that yeah. you are the only other person that I know other than the late, great Johnny Cash, Man in Black, who referred to her as Crete. So when you did that in the email completely uns unselfconsciously, I said, wow, this lady really knows her stuff. And you have such an affection for somebody like Lucretia Garfield. And James A. Garfield was the president, and he's only president for a few months, and he's dying yep. for 11 weeks. So people don't know him much. So to wow. be the first lady, people don't know her much. And she was really one of the first ones that took the burden up of the president that was murdered and was able to carry that on. She made that her life's work. And she was a young woman still at the time. She could have gone and gotten married again if she wanted. And she maintained his legacy. And part of it today, as we said, you can go see and mentor Ohio. That's great. Another Ohio president there competing there with Virginia for the most is the Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Center in Fremont, Ohio. I have also been there. I took my lovely wife, Kathy, on our way from Canada, bringing all of her stuff in the U-Haul. And I said, oh, hey, right here in Fremont, Ohio, look, there's a presidential library. You uh, want to step in? It's great. And mm -hmm. that started her going to many, many presidential sites with me. So I really always appreciate that. It's a, gr a great memory to go in there with somebody from a, another country. Uh, people in this country mm -hmm. don't really know the hazes that well. So you can imagine being from Canada. But that is a very great spot to go and learn about both of them. And despite that trip, despite reading about them, I did learn something new, even about Lucy. Tell us how she kicked off the tradition of First Lady portraits. Lucy Hayes was First Lady in the 1870s, right after the grants. And she was our first First Lady who had the benefit of higher learning, which would be equivalent of a college education. And she liked art. She enjoyed it, and she did have a certain amount of culture to her. Art, of course, even after the Civil War, as women were starting to emerge into not just a domestic life, they could emerge out a little bit more. Art was something that was socially acceptable. Nobody was going to holler at a woman because she liked art. Hmm. And Lucy noticed in the White House that there were lots of portraits of presidents, but not really any of the first ladies. And so she went on a campaign to acquire some. Most of her predecessors, if they had portraits painted, they remained in the families of that particular first lady and president. And they managed to buy some. They managed to get some on loan. But the big portrait of Martha Washington, that's on the other side of the big Gilbert Stewart, maybe. I'm not sure. Some people say yes. Some people say no. But it looks like a Gilbert Stewart. The big, big, massive one, the one that Dolly Madison had cut out of the frame and saved from the War of 1812. The big, big matching portrait of Martha was done in the 1870s, and she had a commission for the White House and began the legacy of having a First Lady's portrait done. And hers was the first First Lady's portrait specifically painted for the White House. And the Smithsonian Institution has an exhibit of the collected. Oh, tremendous collection. Tremendous collection. Biggest in the world, I think. Thousands of clothing articles of the First Ladies. Oh, yeah. And it's their most popular. I think it is their most popular exhibit. It has never been just taken down and stored. They change it every couple of years to refresh it and to take care of their treasures because some of these articles are very old and you have to keep them impervious to dampness and moisture and dust and dirt and those type of things. The exhibit's been going on for, what, 50, 60 years now, wow. continually. 
And what insights do you hope people get from reading Mary Lincoln's flannel pajamas when they go to the exhibit? Well, hopefully they will appreciate what they'll be seeing at the exhibit. But what I try to do in my writing, when I write about the First Ladies, I try to do something that you don't get in a museum or a presidential library. Some presidential libraries have done it fairly well, but most miss a little bit on it. They are so concerned with the real history, the (laughs) nuts and bolts and everything else. What I try to do is I try to give you flesh and blood, heart and soul, so that you get to know these ladies. They're delightful. Absolutely, because when you look at those dresses in the case on a mannequin, it separates you so much from them. And obviously, as we were saying earlier, you understand that because you don't want people spilling chili sauce on it or you know getting no. smoke on it or whatever might no. happen. These are treasures and you can't replace them. Mm-hmm. But you do want to know the person. And I think that's where Mary Lincoln's flannel pajamas is such a pleasant surprise because I have gone – to even the National First Ladies Library in Canton, Ohio. It's the house that President and Mrs. McKinley lived for a time. It's called the Saxton House. It was her maiden name. It was Saxton, and that was her Mm -hmm. family home that she lived in. The NFL Hall of Fame is also in Canton, where there's the McKinley Library. All historic things you can see, but you're behind a velvet rope and you're behind the glass a little bit. There's not too much that you can really touch there. And thinking about going behind the velvet ropes and everything, I was at the McKinley Museum, which is really, it was part of a library. I was there, I think it was 92 or 93. It was quite some time ago. And it was just a few glass cases with some stuff in it. And then... In this library, it was not a specific dedicated to McKinley Museum. It was a piece of a library. You know, they sectioned it off. But they had this big room, and they put in his desk, and they tried to make it look like the office would have looked like in the White House at that time. And I went, and I was talking to the docent, and I think they were grateful to see me because not too many people were showing up, you know. It's not like a Mount Vernon, some place where you get a lot of visitors. People weren't going there. And when I showed up and I was reasonably knowledgeable and I was asking all these good questions, he says, oh, come with me, come with me. And he took the little velvet stanchion down and he he took (laughs) me in and he let me sit at the desk. And (laughs) it was wonderful. I loved it. It was great. Uh, Well, I envy you sitting at McKinley's desk. And I want to tell people that you can go today. They have a lot about Stark County, Ohio there, and they have much more McKinley, including an animatronic William McKinley and animatronic Ida McKinley who speak to you. So they did not have that when you went in 92. No, 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 no. They have done much more. People know from listening that I'm very passionate about McKinley. You certainly know that because Mm -hmm. I emailed you on the subway and I said, I opened your book. And I found the picture of Ida McKinley. And I said, oh, poor Mm -hmm. Ida. She had such a hard Mm -hmm. life, losing two children tragically, all her health problems, losing her husband. And then I went to the next page where you have the first line of your chapter, which was poor Ida. Poor Ida. And I said, whoa, that's weird. (laughs) Yeah, poor Ida. But, but, you know, she's worth knowing. Very much worth knowing because they are in the history books and I'm not. And you're not. <laughs> and most of our, most of the people tuning in, and uh, you're not. So they are there, and so we should know them. We should know them. The most expensive inaugural gown in history. What was that dress, and who did it belong to? Well, I think it's the most expensive inaugural gown, and it belonged to Rachel Jackson. And Rachel Jackson never really made it to the White House. Her husband, Andrew Jackson, was elected in in November, and he was inaugurated the following March, and Rachel died around Christmas. So she knew she was going to the White House, but she didn't last that long. And by the time she died, she was about 61 or so, and her health was poor. She had a bad heart, and she had a tough life. 
and she wanted to be a first lady about as much as she wanted to hang by her thumbs. <laughs> this was not for her. This was just not for her. She was a very reclusive woman. She had been fun-loving and, and, and everything, but she had been divorced before she married Andrew Jackson. She had sort of somewhat of an arranged marriage when she was about 17, and her first husband was abusive and very unhappy. She was divorced, and she married Andrew Jackson, and unfortunately for everybody concerned, she married him before her divorce was final. Now, I'm being simplistic about it, but we can't go into great detail right now. But the upshot being that it caused a great deal of scandal, and it changed Rachel a lot. She became very withdrawn and very reclusive and a real homebody, did not want to leave her small environment with her family and her friends and just a limited environment. Problem was, Andrew Jackson was sort of born larger than life, and he was a man who just couldn't stay put. And when he became president, when he was finally elected president, and he was no youngster, he was past 60 when he was elected, Rachel didn't want to go to the White House. She didn't want to go at all. But he wanted her to go with him, and so she said, okay, she would go, and she'd bring a couple of young nieces with her to do the social stuff, and she'd just pretty much hang out in her rooms a lot. But she needed a gown. She was going to need an inaugural gown. And so she went into town with some friends into Nashville to have a new gown made. And Rachel was a heavy woman. She had become very stout, and the heart condition didn't help because a lot of her stout was also puffy, you know, from the edema that you get if you have a bad heart. And they got her fitted for this gown that really was supposedly, uh, and we have to say supposedly because we have not seen it, more suitable to a young bride than a 60-something-year-old woman with a bad heart and 30, 40 pounds overweight. But she went in and she went for a fitting for this gown. And she reads in the paper that was in the dressmaker's shop that Jackson's enemies, and he had a lot of them, dredged up this whole irregularity about Rachel's divorce and her, quote, bigamous marriage and her adulterous marriage. And they were just dredging up all this stuff about her. And she was just so unhappy, she left the dressmaker shop in a flood of tears, and her friends brought her back to the hermitage, and she collapsed, and a couple of days later, she had a heart attack, and the upshot was that she died, and she was buried in her inaugural gown. So I figure it has to be the most expensive inaugural gown of any, because it cost her life. And it's the longest worn one, which is very sad that she did. And she's still yeah, wearing it. Still wearing it. She's still wearing yeah. it. Still wearing it. Yep. And nobody saw it. Wow. Nobody has seen it. Yes. Well, we will see many things in the book. I didn't touch too much on the early 20th century first ladies. And for that, I apologize. People can read about them in the book. One we will touch on, though, is Calvin Coolidge. He tells his wife, Grace, to dye their white dog another color, which I thought was such a lovely example of this dry (laughs) wit that he had. Why? Coolidge really liked his wife to be a snappy dresser. He really liked that. He himself was a pretty snappy dresser, but snappy for men in the 1920s, you know, looked pretty much the same all the time. But he liked his wife to look sharp. And Grace Coolidge was a sharp-looking lady. She had a nice figure, and clothes looked good on her. And he took a big interest in her clothes and her hats and her wardrobe and everything. And when she was having her portrait painted, Howard Chandler Christie was the artist who painted her portrait. And it's a very famous portrait, and she's wearing this red dress with a real 1920s look to it, that straight, slim line. And it was really very, very elegant, very, very sharp looking. But anyway, the artist 
spent a lot of time going through Grace's closet to see now what can we put you in? What's going to look right? How do we want to do this? And he had her trying things on and holding it up on hangers. And Coolidge uh, wanted very much for Grace to wear a particular white dress that was his favorite dress that he liked. And the artist said, no, I don't think so. And Coolidge said, well, I really like that white dress. And Grace was pretty noncommittal about it. She didn't really care, but she was kind of inclined to let the artist have his way, and he knows better. Coolidge kept saying, no, the white dress, the white dress. And finally, the artist explained that what he wanted to do to show some warmth and style for the picture, they had a white collie named Rob Roy, and they wanted to have Grace with the white collie. And he says, and you put her in this red dress with the white collie next to her. It's a wonderful contrast in colors. And I think Coolidge knew he was not going to win this argument. (laughs) You know, what did he know about art? He didn't know anything about art. He didn't know much about color or contrasting colors. But he did know he was not going to win the argument. And finally, he just says, well, die the dog. (laughs) (laughs) Leave the white dress. Leave the white dress. Die the dog. Well, many great funny moments like that in the book. Again, they go all the way up to Mamie Eisenhower. And because I have a first lady historian here, I have a rare opportunity to ask a question about something I like to proselytize about, and that is Mamie Eisenhower's sugar cookies. Have you ever tried them? Um, Cookies are not on my list of eat much of. (laughs) Uh, You know, when you have a name like Feather... It's wonderful incentive to keep your weight down, um, <laughs> and it's a, it's not easy. <laughs> and the older I get, the less easy it's becoming. Yeah. You know, so cookies are not something that I have ever really allowed myself <laughs> too much luxury of. But I think Ike was the one who was really the cook in the family. Well, this is a souvenir from one of the libraries I went to. They will give it to you on a card. Abilene, Kansas is a really wonderful place packed full of a lot of historic museums and sites and whatnot. And they gave Mm -hmm. me a card there that – says the recipe for Mamie Heisenhower's sugar cookies. My wife made Mm -hmm. them for me. I'm not a big sweets and cookie person either, but Mm -hmm. she made them for me, and I took one bite, and I said, this is why Ike was always smiling. And when you taste them, it is fun to think back to these are what she would have sent him when he was over there planning D-Day. These are what she would have been making Mm -hmm. for him when he came home from West Point or when he was trying to advance his career in the First World War. Mm -hmm. I am going to send you that recipe, and hopefully you will post it at featherfoster.com so people can go there. Yeah. Okay, great. Get Mamie Eisenhower's sugar cookies. I will do that. Yeah. (laughs) It is a very good, very good, simple. I will try it. (laughs) Very good, simple sugar recipe. Well, Feather Mm -hmm. Foster author of Mary Lincoln's Flannel Pajamas. I don't want you ever to call me to help you move those 2,000 or so books total that you have, not because I'm not happy to help you, but because I know Mm -hmm. I'll stop and be reading and that we'll never get the things moved. But I do Mm -hmm. hope you will call me again about future books. If you're listening and you want to know if President Lincoln's wife actually did wear flannel pajamas. No, we didn't forget. You'll just have to pick up the book for that fascinating story. Feather Foster, thank you so much for joining us and the best of luck with the book. Thank you very much. This was just a joy. Just a joy. Well, the joy was all mine. My sides are hurting. How many history books can you say you read that your sides are splitting? Uh, this is wonderful. And I uh, hope your listeners will buy the book and, and get it. It's available Hardcover, soft cover, and any kind of device, you know, ebook that you can get. So, and it doesn't cost much. No, nope. very reasonable. Not an exaggeration to say it's about forty books in one. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you very much for having me. Again, the book is Mary Lincoln's Flannel Pajamas and Other Stories from the First Lady's Closet. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there, or even bookmark the URL off the banner ad on our homepage for all your online purchases. Amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every dollar you spend at no additional cost to you. Once again, 
thanks to Feather Schwartz Foster for joining us and for letting us peek into the closets of our First Ladies in order to get to know them just a little bit better. Please remember to check out that sample chapter of her book at featherfoster.com and to follow her on Twitter at Feather S. Foster. And let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. Well, that's it for this First Lady Fashion installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for Classical Wisdom Wednesday, History in Five Friday, and next Monday's all-new interview. And remember, if you subscribe to us on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Just takes a click of your little finger there to drop us a star. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thank you for spending some time with us, and happy reading. And how, how did you get the name Feather? It showed up on my birth certificate. <laughs> we still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west Sign things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of.